Now today, uh, our topic, and, and again, we're talking uh, about these life processes, uh, the, the things that are sort of the, the, the physiology and related topics that, that go on uh, with, with organisms. And obviously, reproduction is very important. Uh, virtually all living things have to reproduce. Uh, we've talked about all kinds of reproduction. We've talked about just fission, simply dividing yourself into two organisms, uh, basically making uh, multiple identical twins uh, from that. And when I say identical twins, I, I mean identical twins genetically. Obviously, something that just divides itself has, has got the same genome in it. Uh, we've talked about some other reproductive strategies. Uh, we've, we've talked about uh, uh, things like snails. Uh, snails are hermaphroditic. They contain both male and female sex organs in those. Now, they do crossbreed. They, they don't mate with themselves, but there are some organisms. Uh, we, we mentioned things like the tapeworm, where it produces these proglottids, and the proglottids have the, the testes and ovaries in there. Uh, and so they don't crossbreed. They, they actually reproduce using their same genome uh, in there. Related to reproduction to me are also populations and, and so we're going to talk a little bit today about populations and population growth. This is a, a topic that is really near and dear to my heart because I think as human beings we have forgotten we have a human population explosion on this planet and it's my contention that 80% of the conflict that we have among populations and societies and so forth is due to we've just got too damn many people here. And, and uh, you know, it used to be when, when you never saw anybody else, you didn't have a conflict with them. Uh, and you were just strugg struggling to try to survive, or your clan was trying to struggle uh, to survive. But even then, it's kind of interesting. We had war, we had fights then. Uh, two clans got uh, saw each other, and they go, "Well, this is our territory. You need to be hunting your your buffalo or elk over there." Uh, and we even had fights then. But now that it, we've got this really big population explosion, uh, those conflicts are going to increase. Now. I'm also sort of a fatalist. I believe that this planet Earth will do what it will do. Uh, and what has it shown us when we've overpopulated in the past? And I'm not talking about human beings, but any kind of an animal that's overpopulated. Typically, there will be some population controls that, that come in. And I'm, I, I see that going on right now. I see a, a strange diseases. If you think about it, there are diseases that we haven't heard about. And all of a sudden, they're showing up. Uh, what's the latest one that, that children are getting? Have you heard that one? This polio-like thing. They haven't even figured out what the virus is that's causing that. Uh, but, but it scares the bejeebers out of me. The, the, where's this stuff coming from uh, and, and what will it be its impact? Uh, uh, especially when we've got uh, some of our government agencies that say, well, we don't need to take care of health care. We don't need to, to do anything about uh, uh, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, uh, the major agency that, that sort of monitors what's going on and how it's going on and, and so forth. Uh, we, we need to pay real attention to a lot of those. Okay, enough for the political ad for today. Let's get into sex. And I always love to do this. Uh, I've already sprung it on you a couple of times that insects are bisexuals. And, and what do we mean by a bisexual organism? What's the scientific definition of that? <laughs> You don't remember? That means that there's males and females. So a bisexual species is a species that has definable males and females. <clears throat> now, obviously, we've changed that uh, term in our, our car, uh, common parlance. Uh, we, we now, in, in common terms, we, we say that a bisexual individual is somebody that, that can either like both sexes or tolerate both sexes and, and so forth. So, But to a scientist, when I say a species is bisexual, I mean that there's males and females in that population. Now, when we say that there are males and females, that means that the males are going to produce sperm. 
So they're going to have to have testes in order to produce the, that sperm. And if we go all the way back to even the sponge, remember that sponges actually produce sperm and eggs. Now, in this case, they, they would be the equivalent of hermaphroditic. They, they've got primordial cells that do produce the sperm and do produce the eggs, and those are released into the water. Uh, and they mate and form that little uh, blastula and then the gastrula, and then that settles down and makes this undifferentiated mass of cells again. But when it comes to sex, they do make those gametes. They, they make the sperm and the egg. As we move up the line, what we find is, is that uh, uh, unlike the sponge, which when it decides to have sex, can change these cells into those cells that, that are reproductive, most other higher animals have defined testes and ovaries. Now the testes are kind of a complicated organ in, in that there will be what we call the germative cells. Now for you, uh, for the insects, that, that would be down here in the testes, and the testes contains these little tubes in there, which we call sperm tubes, and that's where we get that. Now we didn't talk about this in genetics, but there is what we call a reduction of the genome. Remember that you have on each one of your chromosomes, you have two copies of a gene. And during the formation of the sperm, those two copies split apart, and one copy goes into one sperm, and the other copy goes into another sperm. And, and so uh, we, we have this reduction. Why do we have that reduction? Well, when the sperm combines with the egg, now that half of the genome is going to combine with the other half of the genome from the female, and then we're going to have the zygote. And remember, the zygote is, is merely that one cell in which the egg and the sperm have combined. And now we have the, the two copies, again, of the DNA, one from the mother, one from the father. Or in our case, one from the female, one from the male. Now, <coughs> sperm are kind of interesting things in, in that traditionally, sperm have to somehow get to the egg. And, and so in the evolution of sperm, sperm have de uh, developed tails. And, and these tails are not flagella, they're an actual tail. It's a structure that belongs into that, that haploid cell, uh, and they, uh, this allows for mobility. And what we find is that for male infertility, probably the biggest cause of male infertility is not only a reduction in the sperm count that is produced, but lack of mobility. If your sperm can't swim to the egg, it ain't gonna happen. And, and, and so uh, uh, one of those things that, that causes that. Now, of course I'm gonna get off track again here. What are the two biggest causes for sperm immotility, guys? Okay, girls, do you know what it is? Pardon? Too much heat, yeah, we, we tend to keep our junk really close to our body, uh, and so <laughs> so uh, basically by keeping your testicles uh, in the scrotum so it's away from your body heat uh, can Im improve your sperm quality and, and mobility. What are some other things? Heat's probably the most important one. It's your diet. It's so the stuff you eat uh, and, and the chemicals you take in. And, and I hate to say it, but uh, alcohol and drugs are not good for your sperm. And, and, and so watch out for that uh, kind of stuff. Now, it's also kind of interesting in, in that uh, the, even though the sperm, and by the way, there are many insects that have n sperm with no tails on them. And, and there's a big mystery right now is that how do those sperm move? And what, what we're finding out is that there are cilia that are in the male reproductive system that move those sperm. And then when they're ejaculated into the female, uh, there are cilia inside of the, and remember the cilia, those little hair-like structures that come out of, of cells. There are cilia in the female reproductive system that move the sperm into a holding chamber. We'll talk about that uh, here in, in just a minute. And then when the female's really ready to fertilize an egg, as the egg comes down the oviducts, she, with her cilia, she can actually move the sperm to the egg and, and fertilize the egg. So sperm don't have to have 
uh, the, the, a tail, but it certainly helps uh, them move. Now, the vast majority of insects do have sperm with tails, but there are some insects that don't have those. <coughs> now, uh, as I indicated, the sperm themselves that, that have these tails can move, but they usually need some accessory fluids to help them move. Uh, some of these accessory fluids help in their mobility, they help in, in the movement of a packet of the sperm, but also some of these other accessory fluids uh, nourish the, those sperm cells. Those sperm cells themselves, are, if you take a look at them, uh, they're, they're primarily a, a tail that, that's, that's moving and wiggling around to, to propel it forward. But if you look at the head of the sperm, there's almost nothing in there except DNA. And, and so uh, you need energy and, and things that can supply that energy to keep that uh, sperm modal uh, quite often are, are from these accessory glands. Now there's a whole line of research going on and in, to the accessory glands of, of both insects and even our accessory glands. I'll show you the human reproductive system here in a minute, but guys, you've got accessory glands also, and, and your accessory glands are there to help in the mobility of the sperm, the nourishment of the sperm, and, and so forth. And, and so if you're not producing those chemicals uh, very well, uh, things could uh, not be going well in, in your reproduction. So in essence, the sperm are made up here in the testes in these sperm tubes, that's where the reduction goes on. The sperm then are usually stored in what we call a seminal vesicle. And, and so after the sperm are made, uh, an insect can store it for a period of time. Uh, and then eventually when mating does occur, uh, the sperm that are in those seminal vesicles uh, comes down to the ejaculatory uh, duct and, and gets put into the female's uh, reproductive system. And quite often there are various types of accessory glands that may add, as I indicated, fluids to the, that semen that comes out of there to improve the survival of the, of the sperm, the mobility of the sperm, and so forth. <clears throat> now in the female system, we have an ovary and this ovary is very different than what we see in the human being and uh, the human ovary. Uh, in this one, we, we've got a whole system of tubes and all of those tubes are called ovarials. And, and so basically at the very tip end of the ovariole is that reduction that goes on. And, and so we have that genetic reduction to the haploid state, but there's nothing in the egg that will allow the egg to develop. And what's going to have to be in an egg? What's, what's in the chicken egg that that's, lets it develop? Yolk. Yeah, yolk and the albumin, the white that's in that egg. So in essence, what's going to happen is that once the egg has actually been formed by the reduction of the genome to the haploid state, now we have to have cells and development that adds yolk to that or, or the, the, the nutrients, the foods that's going to allow that egg to develop into an embryo. Because here's something that's also extremely different from us. Remember that once we get a zygote and that zygote starts to develop into an embryo, we add nutrients to that embryo in the womb of the female via the placenta. And so we grow an embryo uh, as, as it develops, but with an insect, everything that that insect embryo needs has to be in the egg before the shell goes on it. So as you can see, that's going to be a, a kind of a different system. They're going to have a lot of yolk and material inside of that egg but there's still just a little tiny bit of genetic material in there. And that egg's not going to develop until a sperm uh, goes in, into that egg and adds its genetic component. Now we have the, the uh, diploid state on that embryo can uh, develop. Now, so that, that's in the, the egg production. We have these ovarios that are producing eggs. When the eggs uh, uh, come on down and after they've been developed, uh, what's kind of interesting is that as they come out of the ovarioles, a shell is actually put on them. So the eggs that come out of the ovary and come to the oviduct have a shell on it. What's the problem with having a shell on an egg? What's not happened yet? The, um, 
the egg hasn't been fertilized yet. So how in the world does an insect egg that has a shell on it get fertilized? Well, they have a little trick. They leave a hole in one end of the eggshell, uh, and, and we call it the micropile. I'll show you some, some examples of that. But in essence, once that egg with its shell comes on down here, it comes by a little storage sack, which we call the spermatheca. And, and insect females have the spermatheca, so basically, when a female insect mates, she stores the sperm in that spermatheca. <coughs> Again, there's a lot of research going on with this. Uh, uh, the, we've got some people right here at Ohio State that are looking at the spermatheca of a mosquito. Because if we can change what the spermatheca does, in other words, that spermatheca does provide nutrients to keep those sperm alive for an extended period of time, if we can shut that down, then even though a female mosquito mates, the sperm that she stores may die, and so she can't fertilize eggs. Okay, kind of, kind of a neat trick. So if you understand the details of, of all of this, uh, we, we can try to manipulate it and do things that, that are to our advantage or what we perceive as our advantage. Now, let's think about this. Remember when we had that video on the termites and there, there was that big mega termite queen that was in, in that colony? She's only mated once in there. So she's storing all the sperm in her spermatheca. Uh, I've been reading right now on, uh, on uh, what are called leaf cutter ants. There's a, a nice little popular book and, and when I suffer from insomnia I read a chapter of that and I can usually go to sleep. But the, the reality is, is that they're talking in there that female leaf cutter ants mate once. Now they often apparently they mate with multiple males when they're in, in their nuptial flight or mating flight they may mate with up to, to six to eight males at the same time, but apparently they can store like three to four million sperm in their spermatheca. And for the next 10 to 12 years, they use that sperm. They never mate again. They just keep using the sperm that they have stored in that spermatheca to produce all of their offspring in that colony. So really a different kind of a system. now. <clears throat> as a human being, uh, boy, that would be disastrous to, to our psyche uh, if we only had we, females that mated once. Said, yep, that's it. I got it. I don't need any more. Uh, and, and so that's it. But that's basically what most of the insects do. Now, you can also see here in, in this generalized diagram that there's other types of glands that are associated with this. Uh, they, we just have um, things like spermathecal gland. That's something that's probably going to produce chemicals that e either help move the sperm or keep the sperm alive and, and provide nutrients to them. There can also be accessory glands that allow for different things to happen to the eggs, uh, allow the eggs to slide through and slide out and, and get deposited. Or in the case of the cockroach, uh, we, we know that the accessory glands in that vagina area produce this egg case, an oothecum, uh, that, that produces things that uh, surround uh, the mass of eggs and so forth. So these, uh, we just call them accessory glands here, but they can be variously modified for the different purposes that are needed. Now we compare this to our system. In many aspects, it's remarkably similar. Uh, if you take a look, especially in, in the male system, uh, again, we've got the testes, on, and uh, inside the testes, we have those germative cells that are in there that, that are undergoing reduction division so that we get to haploid sperm. Now, the sperm need a whole bunch of, of nutrients to move and so forth in, in us, uh, and, and so uh, once the, the sperm are, are produced, they move down the vas deferens, and we need the glands there uh, that, that are involved uh, that help move the sperm up into a seminal vesicle. And, and so uh, we, we store our sperm in that seminal vesicle. Now. Uh, what we do find is, is that also in order to propel or to ejaculate that sperm, there's a little muscular organ there, the prostate, which produces accessory uh, juices and fluids that help move the, the ejaculate uh, into the vagina of the female. Uh, but 
what happens to that muscle over time? You're too young to do this. I'm experiencing it right now. What happens to that prostate gland? It enlarges, absolutely. It, 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 it gets enlarged. When it, it gets enlarged and kind of inflamed, uh, it's obviously going to press on the urethra. That's the, and here's the problem. The urethra comes from, uh, from your kidneys that come down, goes through there, plus the vas deferens and, and the uh, seminal vesicles go in there, so you, you have a common uh, duct that, that comes out from that. What happens when you get the, the, this muscular organ in there that, that normally is supposed to pump that sperm out and, and ejaculate it, when it gets too muscular, it begins to pinch off that urethra and it also can swell up into the bladder this is why old guys like me get up two times of the night to go pee when I was your age I could go forever without peeing now I gotta go do that okay and, and uh, part of this because the prostate's enlarged what can also happen to that prostate there's a lot of cells that are dividing and reproducing in there that's one of the reasons why it swells up but when you have cells that have germinative capability that, that keep reproducing and dividing and so forth it's often a place where cancer can get started and, and so we hear about prostate cancer also and it, it's uh, merely because uh, <laughs> what we think is actually going on here is that in the past males didn't live past 30 or 40 years and so we didn't have that problem and, and now that we have people that are living uh, well into their 80s to 100s uh, weird things happen to these tissues that weren't designed in the first place to go past 40 years old and, and so uh, those are important things to, to remember <clears throat> now in the female system uh, again we're going to have the ovary uh, but in this case what we find is that the ovary when you slice through the ovary we don't see those uh, germative tubes in there. What we see is a mass of cells in which some of the cells undergo this reduction division and end up producing an egg. Uh, and to that egg, what's also interesting to me, there's a little bit of yolk that's added to that egg, but it's, it's a, an egg that really doesn't have the kind of yolk that we would see on, in other animals, things like birds or things like insects that have a lot of yolk inside of that egg. Ours has a, just a little bit of yolk. Now, another thing that we're also finding out is that the eggs that uh, women produce in, in human beings also have what appears to be nurse cells around it. And, and that's turning out to be really important uh, because these nurse cells that are, surround that egg help protect that egg. Uh, they can also influence whether that egg gets fertilized or not and, and also embedded uh, once it is fertilized uh, in the, the uterus. But in essence, what happens is that for most women, once a month, uh, they go through a hormonal cycle uh, in which they produce an egg. Uh, sometimes they get really fertile and, and they might produce a couple of eggs. And, and what's going to happen uh, if a woman uh, uh, mates and, and she's got two eggs ready? You're going to have twins. Uh, and what kind of twins would those be? Pardon? Those would be fraternal twins. On the other hand, what we find is in some cases when an egg is fertilized, uh, the egg for whatever reason might divide what would that be those would be identical twins uh, because they're, they're the same genome when the sperm uh, genome mixed with the egg genome but then the egg or the embryo divided then you get identical twins uh, in there now we, we now know that most of the fertilization that occurs occurs up in the fallopian tubes. It, it, we, uh, we used to think, uh, at least what I was first taught about uh, human sex, that it occurred here in the uterus. And, and most of the fertilization, the sperm have to travel from the vagina, through the cervix, up through the uterus, and in the fallopian tubes. And so to a little sperm with a flagellum uh, or, or uh, a tail, that's an incredible distance to have to travel in, in terms of their size. That's why you need good mobility uh, of the sperm in order to accomplish that. 
So the egg often gets fertilized up in the fallopian tube uh, with those nerve cells around it. It generally will ascend down through the fallopian tube, and once it gets to the uterus, it will come into contact with the uterine uh, wall, and then there will be a placenta that's formed around that. And the placenta, again, is this complicated organ that provides the nutrients and oxygen and everything else that the developing embryo needs. Now, sometimes that doesn't happen. The fertilized egg occasionally gets embedded in the tissues of the fallopian tube. Wow. What's going to happen then? pain, agony, uh, and usually a, a spontaneous abortion. It, it's, it's going to abort itself because it's in the wrong area. In some cases, if, if it really starts developing what we call an eptopic uh, uh, fertility, uh, we're going to have to surgically go in there and remove that. And, and so uh, not a pleasant thing. But if you think about it, when we've got a complicated system, stuff can go wrong with that system. All right, hopefully that gives you a, a little bit of comparison uh, bet between what the insects have and what we have. We're both bisexual species. We've got males and females. The architecture, uh, especially in the male, is very similar to what I see in the architecture of, of the insect. But when it comes to the female, the architecture is quite different. Uh, and, and it's primarily because uh, we have uh, a womb and a placenta where we grow the embryo while the insect has a system where it's got to produce an egg with a shell on it and the, all the things that's in that egg are needed in order for that embryo to develop. <coughs> Some other terms that, that we see with this. Uh, Oviparous means to lay eggs, and, and the vast majority of insects are oviparous. We are what we call viviparous. Vive means life, paris means to give birth, and, and so ova, paris, would be egg uh, birth, and, and this would be live birth. Now, what are the animals that give live birth? Pretty much mammals are the ones that give live birth. Uh, there are some snakes that give live birth. Is that vivipary? No, those snakes actually still produce a, an egg with a shell on it. The egg is fertilized inside the female reproductive system actually before the shell is put on it. But the eggs are retained in the equivalence of, of a vaginal pouch on those. The eggs are allowed to develop inside this vaginal pouch with no extra nutrients. The female doesn't give extra nutrients to those, uh, but we believe that that's a, a way that you can sort of protect your embryos as they're developing. If you deposited those eggs somewhere, a predator could come along and, and get those eggs. So in that particular case, what we find is, is that they still, in essence, those snakes that do that uh, are what we call Ovo, they per still produce an egg, but viviparous means that it looks like they're giving live birth. Insects do this all the time. There are many groups of insects in which the female retains the eggs inside of her reproductive tract. The egg's development uh, occurs, and upon hatch of the egg, the new little nymph or larva that, that has come out of that egg with a shell on it uh, emerges and so it looks like they're uh, giving birth to these insects but in, in reality it's what we call this ovovivipary. Now the eggs themselves of insects are all very characteristic. You may think that all insect eggs look alike but uh, they, they really uh, are all over the, the place. As a matter of fact there's uh, uh, one of the papers that, that I worked on in which we took a look at the, all the different egg shell configurations of the sod webworms, a group of little caterpillars, you can actually, if you have an electron microscope, you can identify each species of sod webworm just by the, the shape and form of the egg that, that is in there. Now, these are assassin bug eggs. I, I thought these were really pretty. They look almost like a little flower uh, in there. But what you're seeing here is the chorion, or the, the egg shell. And then on one end of this is this little flower-like structure. In the middle of this is a little hole. 
and that's that micro pile that I was talking about. And that little hole has to be there in order for the sperm to enter that egg and, and provide its genome to the haploid egg in order to make that a diploid individual. Here are alderfly eggs. Uh, now, in this case, alderflies really, there's nothing spectacular about the eggs. Now, in this particular case, the, the alderfly, now this is one of the little neuroptera uh, that, that's related to the uh, things like the Dobson flies. But you can see here where the female has found a place that she's going to lay her eggs, and typically this is a, a, a tree leaf that's overhanging water because the larvae are aquatic. What she does is that she's able to sense that she's over water, and as you can see, she lays eggs. It's kind of interesting. The, the first row of eggs that she laid was down here. So she takes her abdomen and goes plunk, 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 plunk. And after she lays that row, she takes one little step forward and then lays the next row. And, and so each of these rows, she's taken a little step forward and, until she's completely emptied out uh, her uh, oviducts uh, with that. What I want you to also see is that notice each one of these eggs has got a little nipple on the end of it. That's the micropile. That's that, that little opening for the sperm to go in there and fertilize that egg. Here's some other ones. Uh, here, here's uh, the yellow neck caterpillars. Now remember that we indicated that in the female reproductive system there can be accessory glands that are associated with the, the ovaries and the oviducts. And in the case of the tussock moth, when the eggs come out, her accessory glands make this basically biological styrofoam. And, and so she makes a little egg case that, that has this sort of foam-like material that hardens. To me, it looks just like styrofoam, only it's a biological base. Now, why would she make that stuff? What do we use styrofoam for? insulation and, and in essence we think that that is a biological insulation because most of those eggs are going to have to overwinter and next spring uh, they, they will uh, hatch up. Here's the little sod webworm eggs that I was talking about and, and you can see or just barely see the, the little striations on, on these. There are different numbers of the striatae and then there's little cross uh, striatae on, on those uh, but, but each species of sod webworm has a different number of ribs on it and cross striatae uh, which allows us to, to identify what species that we've got. Many of you have probably seen lady beetle eggs. Uh, it's a very common, you see this little patch of spindle shaped eggs uh, that, that are out uh, uh, on plant material and so forth. Uh, those are lady beetles. <coughs> Here's a bill bug. Now many insects have learned that they need to put their eggs uh, in a spot where the larvae can make the best use of them or they might be protected. In the case of a bill bug, the female bill bug actually chews a hole, makes a little cavity in the stem of a grass plant, then she turns around and squeezes an egg in that little hole. And, and that's really advantageous. Number one, it, it protects the eggs from predators and, and parasites, because it's not out in the open, not easy to, to locate. But guess what bill bug larvae eat? they eat the stems of grasses. So it's put right in the spot. When it hatches out, it can just start chewing right down through that stem. Uh, it's, it's right where its food's going to be. Now, in some cases, what we find is that uh, eggs may need some extra help. Uh, and in the case of white grubs, uh, virtually all white grubs lay a dehydrated egg. In other words, they've got an egg that has a very concentrated yolk in it, but the yolk is so concentrated that the embryo really can't develop efficiently. What has to happen is that that egg has to be laid in a moist environment and it will absorb moisture from the surrounding area and it will swell up. And, and so you can see it's literally doubled in size and in, in, in volume and it needs that water. It needs that water actually in about 36 to, to 48 hours uh, or the egg will die. And, and so uh, white grub adults are always looking for moist soil in order to lay their eggs because they need that moist soil in order for those eggs to develop. Some eggs are put in cases. Uh, here's the, the praying mantidae case. This happens to be the, the Asian mantid, that really big one. Uh, our native praying mantids put theirs in, in slightly different 
uh, looking cases. But again, basically what this is, is is a sort of a biological styrofoam in which the eggs are embedded in there. And again, it's to protect it during the winter time because virtually all the praying mantids overwinter as an ootheca or egg case uh, with the eggs inside of there and that styrofoam pro uh, provides protection for that. <clears throat> in some cases, uh, we, we see uh, uh, parental care of the eggs. And we've already talked about earwig. Uh, earwig females will do that. Uh, the earwig female will make the, this little egg chamber, usually in the late fall or in the winter time. She'll lay her eggs in there if she survives through the winter and very early springtime, and then she will take care of those eggs. Now, she doesn't give feed, feed the eggs or do anything like that, but she will regularly pick the eggs up. She will clean them off if there's any dirt or debris on them, and any eggs that might have what appears to be a bacterial disease or a fungal disease, she will usually eat it and get rid of it, or she'll take it and, depo and dispose of it somewhere away from the rest of the eggs in order to, to not infect uh, the, the rest of those eggs. We've already mentioned with the cockroaches that they have an egg pouch that they make, that they put their eggs in, uh, that ootheca. And, and so again, uh, a clutch of, of eggs put into some sort of a case uh, is generally called an ootheca. Here's some aphids. And do you see what this female aphid is doing right here? What's that? It's a little baby aphid being born. But what kind of birth is this? That's ovovivipary. That, that female aphid did produce eggs uh, inside of her, her reproductive system, but she retained the egg inside of a chamber, allowed the embryo to develop inside that egg, inside of its shell, and just when it was ready to hatch, she extruded out the little nymph uh, that, that's coming out there. And, and We'll learn later on that, that uh, these aphids are really uh, reproductive factories. Uh, what's even more important, we haven't talked about this, that female aphid is not only ovoviviparous, but she is also parthenogenic. That means that she's able to develop her embryos uh, in the eggs without mating. Uh, and, and we'll find that many insects do that. Uh, it's been shown that some of these aphids can give a birth per day. <laughs> uh, and, and in other words, she probably has three or four other developing embryos inside of her body. And, and as they develop, she extrudes them all out. Uh, you can see all these little babies. Most of these little babies are probably from her uh, around there. Uh, and these, uh, all of these are going to be female. Uh, because they, since they haven't had sex, they, 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 uh, when they asexually reproduce, it's got to be females. These little nymphs will typically take about five to seven days to completely develop, and they'll start giving birth also. This is why aphid populations, uh, you can walk by a plant one week, come back the next week, and it seems to be covered with aphids. They are just reproductive factories. Now, we just opened the, the door there for do we need sex or not? Do we need to change, exchange genetic material? And basically in, in insects there are uh, uh, several methods that, that they can use. Probably the most uh, method is, is parthenogenesis. And, and what we mean there is that uh, an egg can be produced and, and that egg is viable. It can produce an embryo that produces a, a, a nymph or a larva without fertilization. <clears throat> now, most of these, when we look at them, they're diploid. So it appears what's going on in the reproductive system is that in the ovary, there's a reduction division that goes on, but then two reduction division uh, bodies fuse back together to make it diploid. So it, it goes from haploid back to diploid. Being diploid again, it can now uh, uh, finish its development. So sperm wasn't needed in there, uh, and, and we find that as, as parthenogenesis. Now there are some other insects that are really kind of different. Uh, what we find in, in, let's say, the hymenoptera, the bees and wasps, 
that when a female has an egg that comes down through her oviducts, when she fertilizes that egg, that will develop into another female bee or wasp. However, if an egg comes down through the oviduct and she closes off the spermatheca and an egg isn't released, that egg is haploid. That egg will still develop into an embryo, but now it will be a male embryo. And, and it will turn into a male bee or wasp. So in bees and wasps, the males are haploid and the females are diploid. Some, some really different kind of stuff going on in there. Uh, we've talked about a lot of other phyla of animals uh, are very commonly hermaphroditic. Uh, we, we talked about the earthworms as being hermaphroditic or the annelids. Uh, we, we talked about the, the uh, uh, mollusca uh, being hermaphroditic and, and so forth. And many of the earlier uh, phyla also are, are hermaphroditic. But hermaphrodism in insects is extremely rare. And as, as far as I know, there's only a couple of cases. Uh, there's one where the, we've got this cottony cushion scale where it, it appears that uh, uh, it, it has both uh, male and female sex organs in there. Very unusual. Some of the questions always come by, well, maybe the question, nobody wants to express it. What about, do we see homosexuality in, in insects? And the answer to that is that there has been definitely been recorded uh, incidences where it appears that males will try to mate with other males, but we usually consider that to be a case of mistaken identity. Uh, you don't see very well. Uh, you got these compound eyes, and, and if it looks right and, and walks right, uh, males will try to mate with it. You see this all the time with Japanese beetles. Uh, if you see Japanese beetles up on a, a tree leaf, you'll find that, that uh, the, the males are usually out on the outer, and they're trying to mate with anything that looks right. Uh, and and uh, half the time, it's another male, and the other male says, "Hey, cut that out! Get, get, get out of there!" <coughs> now. We do have one interesting case that showed up a couple of years ago, and that uh, the, the headlines in the publication is, is homosexuality was, was found to occur in scorpion flies. Now, we didn't talk that much about scorpion flies. These are in the order Mycoptera. Uh, the males have these big fancy genitalia, but the, the essence of the story was is that they found out is that the scorpion flies often live in, in groups. There will be a fairly good population of both males and females in the area. But what the study found is that the big males in the population will often grab a hold of the smaller males in the population. They'll pin them down. They'll pin down their, their, this fancy copulatory apparatus, uh, and the big male will deposit his sperm on that copulatory apparatus. And so when the lesser male mates with a, with a female, it's not his sperm that gets transferred, it's the big guy's sperm. Uh, now, I don't think that's really homosexuality in, in, in the, the, uh, that kind of a sense, but it, it was uh, a pretty interesting and somewhat kinky uh, way of, of uh, reproduction. Oh, my God. All right. You don't need to know all of these. But I just wanted to wanted you to understand that when we say that an insect is parthenogenic, that's only part of the story. There can be a whole group of different kinds of parthenogenesis. There can be obligate parthenogenesis, and, and we see this uh, primarily in some scale species. There's only females known. Uh, we only see them. Uh, there's a little weevil that's uh, called the black vine weevil. There's only females known. We don't know of any males in the population. And so when there's no males in the population, they're obviously obligate parthenogenic. They're always going to reproduce parthenogenically. There can also be facultative. Uh, and my favorite case on this one is uh, spider mites. Even though that's not an insect, spider mites are kind of interesting in that uh, when they're first born, when they're, they first hatch out of an egg, spider mite nymphs will often balloon to other plants. And what can happen is that if you get a little female spider mite that balloons to another plant, but there's no other spider mites on that plant, how can she reproduce? Well, she can reproduce without being mated. And, and the thing is, is that when she fertilizes uh, or, or when she produces eggs, all of her offspring will be males. And this is where it gets kinky again. 
she can live long enough that her offspring from her eggs that were all males can come back and mate with her and now that she's mated she can produce female eggs wow and, and so if you think about that one little spider mite female that's even unfertilized can start a whole infestation on a plant <clears throat> now in this faculty, we generally talk about the, the female chooses. And when I say choose, I, 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 I'm not imagining that this, this female sitting there and going, am I going to fertilize these eggs today or not? Uh, it, 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 it's more complicated. There's some hormonal things going on, some behavioral things going on in there. But we've already mentioned that uh, the, in the uh, bees and wasps, that the female, if she fertilizes the egg, that will be females, and those are all typically going to be workers, unless they were reared with special foods to become another queen, uh, or uh, she, the uh, uh, spermatheca can close down and not fertilize the egg, and so they will produce males or drones. <laughs> As you can see here, there's a whole bunch of other terms in, in here in the, the parts of the Genesis. Uh, Arenatoki means that only males are, are produced. Thelatoki only means that females are produced, uh, again, through parts of the Genesis asexual. Uh, there's a couple of interesting little beetle larvae and fly larvae in which the larvae themselves, during their de embryo development, can divide and divide and produce identical twins. Uh, and uh, again, we call that polyembryony. We also have, oh, why do we call that pedogenesis? What's a pedast? Boy, how do you know if you're getting sexual abuse if you don't know the sex terms? A pedast is generally an older person that likes to have sex with a young person, okay? And, and so I find it interesting, the same root word, pedogenesis, means that a larva, when we uh, talk about it here, is capable of reproduction. And again, there are some beetles and flies in which the larva develops sex organs uh, and is capable of reproduction. Generally, it's the female larva that remains larva form and, and develops the ovaries, but the male usually develops into the adult fly or the adult beetle and will mate with that immature form. Let's go back to that aphid. And, and to me, I like to use the aphids to sort of illustrate a lot of the terminology that, that we've talked about here. Uh, I just showed you a wingless female giving birth to nymphs. And so that wingless female would be parthenogenic. That means she hasn't mated. She's also ovoviviparous, but that's only part of the story. What we find with aphids is that if you take a look at it, an aphid species during its entire year, it alternates between two different hosts. So it has usually a spring host and a summer fall host. It alternates between parthenogenic and being ovoviviparous to in the late summer and early fall becoming sexual egg producers. So there will be males and females. When the males and females mate, the females will lay eggs. So we see this, this alternation of, of uh, uh, parthenogenesis and sexual uh, reproduction and alternation between ovovivipary and ovipary producing eggs. <clears throat> I've already indicated to you the, the two spotted spider mite. Uh, this is one uh, again where uh, the typical reproduction is with a male and a female. Here's a little male that's guarding. Actually this is a female nymph that's about ready to shed her exoskeleton. Apparently in these spider mites when the female is ready to molt into the adult she starts releasing a sex pheromone that says uh, if there's any guys in the area uh, I'm going to be ready to mate here in, in just a couple of days. And, and so uh, quite often the males that, that sense that 
uh, uh, with their chemoreceptors will sort of guard up. What do we mean by guard? Well, if there's another male that comes up, the first male there generally will kick the other male away. They, no, 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 I, I, I've got this. Uh, I, I've got this one covered. Uh, and and uh, when she uh, reproduces or uh, molts, I'm going to mate with her, and, and her offspring will be from my mating. As I indicated to you before, the, the bees and wasps are kind of unusual. Uh, and and uh, these are social insects. We've already talked about that a, a little bit. But generally in the bees and wasps, when we have social insects, the entire society is female. And so here I've got a yellow jacket uh, nest, and, and I've got a, uh, this would be the original founding queen. And you can see that, that uh, she's much larger than the rest of the workers. Now, how did she produce those workers? Well, she mated the previous fall with a drone or a male. She stored that sperm all winter long in her, her spermatheca. Then the next spring when she started building a new nest, she laid a few eggs that she fertilized, and those eggs turned out to be other females. Now, uh, since she's gotta be both a mother, in other words, finding food for the larvae and everything, usually those first little larvae are kind of small. They'll, they'll produce little uh, small female workers. Once those female workers are produced, they can then take over the rearing. And all the female then does is just walk around and say, hey, got a place for me to lay an egg yet? And, and uh, oh, and by the way, feed me. I need to make more eggs, so feed me and, and find me places. And, and so she becomes basically this egg-laying machine for the rest of the summer. You can see uh, all of these females. Now, to me, what's interesting is, is typically in late July, early August, this queen, and, and we think it's regulated by sunlight uh, length, uh, that when we've got a declining daylight, uh, that stimulates her body to stop fertilizing some of the eggs. And what that means is that some of those eggs that she produces will be turn out to be males. Other eggs that she produces will be fed special food by the workers, and those will become new queens. And so typically by September and October, inside the nest, are new queens or potential queens and drones and these are the ones that are going to exit the nest they'll mate the drones die but the mated females will overwinter to start a colony the next year kind of an interesting biology here you can see uh, uh, this one has already started producing either drones or queens you can see the normal cells right in here but I noticed that there's some bigger cells right here. Those, those are the ones that are going to be producing the new reproductives for that nest. How do you get together with a potential mate? Almost any method, I mean, now everyone does, you know, there's internets. Uh, in my era, it used to be at, at parties in the bar. That was about the only place that, that uh, you, you would see uh, other potentials. But uh, in essence, what we find with the insects is that hooking up usually entails pheromones. And what do we mean by pheromones? These are chemical materials that are produced. And they, these chemicals can be produced by either the male or the female. But in this case, uh, the sex pheromones means that the individual that's producing that sex pheromone is trying to tell other individuals of its species, I'm in a receptive state. I'm, I'm ready to have sex. Uh, it's usually the female that produces this, but like I said, there are males that also produce sex pheromones uh, to tell the female that they're ready. Now in this particular case, we can see a gypsy moth. Now when I was taking pictures of this gypsy moth, when I came up to her, she looked like this. But I cast a shadow over her body in the process of taking a picture, and she extruded out the tip of her abdomen here. And you can see what there's what we call a hair pencil on the end of that. <clears throat> that hair pencil is basically the, the sex pheromones that she produces inside of her body are extruded out and they go out on those hairs and little hairs divided up and when there's a breeze or air going by it allows that pheromone to be distributed into the air. 
Now, this is what we consider to be a close-range sex pheromone. She had probably also produced a sex pheromone that was what we call a long-range pheromone. That's a pheromone that would be traveling downwind, and a male that's flying around out there would perceive it with his antennae, and he would sort of zigzag back and forth up that cone of, of, of uh, pheromone. But when he would get close, she would extrude that hairbrush again, and typically the male will either stroke that with his legs... Why would he do that? Where's he going to have chemoreceptors? Could be on his legs, could be on his antennae. And what we find is that the males often uh, they will stroke it with, with their legs, or they may even stroke it with their antennae. Uh, and when they get in close, uh, that confirms that, that when she sees the, the shadow, which means that maybe a male's there, she may switch the pheromone to really confirm that, yes, I am the right species, uh, and, and uh, if you confirm that, let's mate. Another way to hook up is for everybody to get out on a mating swarm at the same time. And, and basically, let's have an orgy. And, and uh, many insects do that. Uh, it's most common. We, we see this with uh, things like the termites. Now, this happens to be a, a male and female reproductives of the subterranean termite. They're all coming out on exactly the same time and the same day. And, and basically, they will hook up and, and disperse and, and try to uh, start new colonies. Ants are notorious for this uh, very commonly. Right after a rainfall event, this can occur in the summertime or in the fall. Now, why would it occur right after a rainfall event? Well, rain causes the soil to be softer and, and easier to dig into if you're going to start a new colony. So typically what we see is, is that if there's a rainfall event in the summertime that occurs in the, in the morning or early afternoon and then it, it stops and the sun comes out and, and it gets kind of warm, boom all the ants of a different species will seem to come out. And, and so we see these, these big swarms, even the same species in the area, all coming out. And what they'll do is fly up in the, the air, uh, mix with each other, uh, mate, and, and then the, the mated females, the males usually die again. Now, I find it interesting, in the termites, the male follows the female that he mates with. Um, and they co-found a new colony. When it comes to ants, the ants say, uh, you know, I've made it with you. I'm done with you. I'm going to go start my own colony by myself. There's some other kinky things that can happen with insects. Uh, one of the ones that, that's received no uh, uh, uh being more famous right now are the bed bugs. Uh, bed bugs are kind of interesting in that if you take a look at the female. There doesn't seem to be any normal copulatory apparatus. In other words, the, the males have what we call the ediagus, that would be the equivalent of his penis, that typically has to hook in what we call kind of a lock and key mechanism into the female. Uh, and, and what we see is the male has the ediagus, but there doesn't see any be any place on the female for that to hook in or, or do anything. And, and we now know what the male does, there's actually a little area of thin exoskeleton on the side, on the underside of, of the abdomen of the female. And what the male will do is that he can actually sense whether the female has recently had a blood meal. And that turns him on. Uh, and he senses that with, with his antennae and, and uh, uh, other chemoreceptors. He'll come up to this female that's just had, had a blood meal, uh, and he will take his ediatus and just jab her right in the side of the abdomen. He will ejaculate his sperm into her hemocele, and the sperm migrate through the hemocele uh, into uh, her reproductive system, and, and that will uh, fertilize the eggs. Now, we call that traumatic insemination, <laughs> obviously. What's even more bizarre, it's, it's really funny. Uh, we've, we've got a lady that raises uh, bed bugs here and does a lot of research uh, on them. But uh, it's also been shown that a female that has had one traumatic insemination, uh, she'll produce a clutch of eggs from that. The next time she feeds, she runs. 
And apparently she remembered that this wasn't a pleasant experience. And, and she will literally run, but she usually gets caught by a male, happens again. But it, there seems to be the second time that she feeds to produce another clutch of eggs, she tries to avoid uh, the, the getting mated, but it usually happens anyway.